Sound off for Soul of Detroit. Soul of Detroit, the first podcast. With premium quality throughout in both regular and king size, brings you Soul of Detroit. You asked in a rock and the question's out of my face. It's gone. What are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? That is not paid for by them. That is paid for by the people of Detroit. You might be qualified, ML. I'm not qualified for this job. Let me tell you something. You want to go right now? Okay? You want to go right now, Albert? Hello, my good friends. It's your old pal, ML Elric, coming you to you today on ML Soul Detroit with a very special guest, Alan Lengel of Deadline Detroit. It's an outstanding news site that you should be following and that you should also think about joining as a member to support independent journalism, hard-hitting, incisive, and uh, just high-quality stuff. Alan is going to talk to us about his many adventures over the years with a fella some people know as Richard Wershey, but he's probably better known by his uh, popular sobriquet, White Boy Rick. So Alan's going to talk to us a little bit about that and about why he thinks the many, many years that Mr. Worshi spent in prison was an injustice. Uh, we also have Mark Fellhauer here trying to keep this somehow together. No Sean problem. Windsor has awakened from his slumber. <laughs> He's back from furlough. He's ready to go. And later on, <laughs> Professor Matthew Jennings will join us with a lesson in soft history. And of course, Joe Zuver is the one who's calling all the shots on Facebook Live and elsewhere. Uh, we're grateful to be brought to you this week by Manscaped. This is meant for a man, but strong enough for a woman. It is the personal grooming device and line of products that is pretty groovy, pretty good, and who we are hoping is going to be a longtime sponsor for this show. And so we encourage you to purchase not just their lawnmower, the uh, personal grooming device, which I used. You can use it above the waistline too, Sunshine. I used it to <laughs> trim my beard. It worked uh, very, uh, very effectively. What, what beard? And they also have a fine line of products, including a shampoo and body wash, which has kind of a nice eucalyptus scent, which I, I really like that. So, um, so if you are interested in any of these products, check them out at manscaped.com. In order for them to stay with us, we need you to make a purchase, and you'll get 20% off and free shipping if you use the promo code M. L. Also, for the uh, first listener who makes a purchase of $75 or more, send us a copy of your receipt to mlsoulofdetroit at gmail. And just your receipt. We don't want any other pictures, just the receipt. Yeah, yeah. We don't need your credit card numbers. We don't need before we and after. Yeah, we exactly. certainly do not need before and after. <laughs> and the first person to do that, we will send a extra large Manscaped t-shirt. It's kind of cool. If you don't want the shirt, let us know and we'll send you a Soul of Detroit hat. So this offer is good to first one in, gets their choice, a T-shirt or hat. Everybody who spends $75 after that and lets us know will get a free Soul of Detroit hat to you. So thank you very much. We hope they'll be around for a long time. There really is nothing like a shorn scrotum. It's breathtaking. I suggest you try it. And that shit grows back. So <laughs> Manscaped. Com. So please uh, give them a look. Um, we are also brought to you by our fine, fine friends, uh, a Detroit original, just like us. Oh, Altus wow. Beer. Uh, I'm back playing hockey, which is great. I'm on the ice, and the Altus is on the ice, too. It is making a comeback here in the greatest city in the world, and it's the do-anything-anytime-with-anyone beer. If you only have six, that's enough to make anybody you're with seem like a ten. We have a lot of things that started here in Detroit that went away, but boy, am I glad Altus is back. It's a lager that packs a punch and is seriously smooth and delicious. Go pick up some cans a day for yourself and enjoy. If you don't know where to find it, go to altus.beer, and they will help you find the store near you. Altus, a Detroit original. And Alan's a Detroit original, too. Alan grew up uh, in Oak Park with uh, one of our other friends. We haven't had him on the show yet, but Adolph Mongo, a true Detroit character. Oh, yeah. Adolph Alan is... Uh, Sure. A little, a little less bombastic, and uh, certainly a lot more impartial. But uh, I, I've known Adolf since uh, seventh grade. You've known wow. him since it was cool to be named Adolf. Right, right, right. Yeah, so that's, Adolf that's, in uh, a Jewish school. But uh, yeah, 
Yeah, that's a whole nother show. But um, but uh, but you've also known uh, Mr. Worshi for a long time too. Tell us a little bit about how you met him and and give us some of the backstory of uh, the rise and fall of the man known as White Boy Rick. You know, originally I I I was covering. I was at the Detroit News, and the FBI had had uh, set up a sting. Uh, and as I wrote about it afterwards, I, I became, uh, I started talking to, to Rick from prison all the time, pretty regularly for, you know, more than 20 years. Uh, Rick at 14 was recruited. He knew a lot of the guys in the streets, like the Curry brothers and, uh, the FBI took him in as an informant, which was really probably, uh, too young to take someone in as an informant, but they were giving him money and eventually, uh, you know, they cut him loose and Rick got into the drug gang and uh was doing i mean here it is i mean it's it's so insane a kid who was 16 was had access to a lot of money that you and i as 16 you know if we had you know a couple hundred dollars in the bank we were pretty lucky uh and and rick was uh you know rick was going to northland buying suits you know at that time you know this is the, the 80s he was buying you know 500 dollars suits i know he, i know some of the stores he was going to and uh he was living a good life and then you know and then he got he got busted at 17 he got convicted at 18 and the state of michigan was was you know people were trying to figure out how do we deal with this you know drug craze and so they passed a ridiculous law saying that if you had 650 grams or more, it was mandatory life without parole. So here's a kid, you know, at 18 who's sentenced to that, mandatory life without parole. And the, the, the criminal thing is one, they, they eventually, surprisingly under the Engler administration, changed that law to, it was, it changed his sentence to life with the possibility of parole. But but, but, you know, by then he got no break. I've, I've never seen, I've been covering law enforcement for decades and, and federal law enforcement for, you know, more than 30 years. I've never seen a witness, a person who has helped and cooperated with law enforcement not get one day knocked off his uh, sentence. And, you know, even, even in Florida, where he had to uh, finish up uh, another sentence, he didn't get one day, even during COVID, they made him serve every single day. I mean, they could have cut him loose in March and they made him till July 20th to the exact day that he was eligible. Now, Rick, Rick uh, has never, um, I mean, he admits, yeah, he, he did the crime. You know, I, he shouldn't right. have been the longest serving nonviolent juvenile in the history of the state. Um, my question for somebody who has talked to him and, and knew him fairly well do you think he would have gotten into that lifestyle if he wasn't an informant um, at such a young age? Or do you think that is the sole reason he got into dealing because that's what he knew from being an informant? Uh, I, you know, I, I think people, and, he, and he'll, he'll say that it was because they took him as an informant and got him in. But, I mean, look, he was around the drug world. I don't, I don't know. I, I don't know what would have happened. I mean, it's tempting, you know, when you basically create an underground economy, there's no jobs around, and suddenly you see everybody's got money. You know, you're 16 years old and, and people have $500 in their pockets. Even the small time guys who were stationed in, you know, crack houses were making 500 a week. Uh, that's a lot of money for, you know, a high school kid. Uh, that's a lot of money for a teenager. So I, I can't say for sure, but it certainly uh, contributed to the reason whether whether it wouldn't have happened, whether it would have happened anyways, no one can say, but. It certainly did happen, and, and it was because I, I think that was a contributing factor that they certainly they, they gave him a taste of money. So when the 650 uh, lifer law is uh, repealed and other criminals are let go and or have parole hearings, why was he not granted uh, parole hearings or at least farcical parole hearings? What Who kept him you know, in there that long? You know what? A lot of people... Uh, you know, his, he has theories, some of the, there, you know, there's some FBI agents who ended up retiring who continued to work for him. I mean, it is insane. I mean, uh, Kim Worthy, I, mm -hmm. I, I, I blame her for a lot of this. She'll deny that she was behind it, but she tried to portray him as Pablo Escobar, that he was a danger to society. They had people going, they had a parole hearing in 2003, uh, 
and he was denied parole. They had people who came out and said he's destroyed the fabric of this community, which is just insane. Mm-hmm. There were so many crack dealers. There were so many bigger drug dealers, the Curry Brothers, Young Boys Incorporated. There were there were people, you know, Pony Down. Uh, the, you know, the, the name of the groups are endless. And he was just really not he was not a kingpin. And, and the problem was also he became, a, you know, his fame became a liability. Yep. Uh, yep. The governor could have pardoned him and should have pardoned him. But, you know, Governor Snyder, what's he got? Why would he do that? He's like, this guy's got a big name. If he like, if he gets out, he gets in trouble. It's, it's all a political liability to me. But the fair thing would have been to parole him. But there were people. And, and the other thing is, Kim Worthy was good friends with Gil Hill. Mm-hmm. And Gil Hill almost got caught up in that sting. And Gil Hill, and they were all, you know, Coleman Young was mad at, at Rick Worshey because he dragged, you know, he dragged not only his niece, but also his brother-in-law or common-law brother-in-law into the whole thing. So there were a lot of people that he crossed and and they tried to make sure that he never got out. Yeah, it really seems interesting once uh, Gil Hill passed away, things started to speed up a little bit. Yes, and, yes. Uh, and- I- I, I don't know that that was a coincidence either, but, you know, suddenly uh, Kim Worthy was saying, well, there were some uh, Supreme Court rulings in like 2012 was one of them where they were talking. They were telling judges had to to review sentences of life sentences without parole for murder of uh, involving teens. Mm-hmm. And the idea was that teens brains are not, you know, formed They're as dumb. well as yeah. you know, adults and they're more impulsive. And that they should be given special consideration. Well, here it was. Rick had the same sentence, a mandatory life without parole and not with any murders to it. And he was serving time like that. And so Kim Worthy finally said, well, the Supreme Court rulings. But it happened to come at the same time Gil Hill passed away. And I think and she had a friendship with Gil Mm -hmm. Hill for for a long time. So I'm not sure it was a coincidence. So, Alan, I, I don't want to uh, I don't want to make him any bigger or smaller than he really was. I mean, he was involved in some pretty heinous stuff. I mean, he was dealing drugs that ruined a lot of lives, and uh, there's no getting around that. But what what I've always find found so um, staggering about this case is there were a lot of people doing that, as you say. So it's not like it's acceptable, but it wasn't uncommon. But he was so helpful to the feds and to some extent DPD, he seemed to have gotten no credit for that whatsoever. I mean, have you you ever seen a case where somebody went so hard for the feds? I mean, almost, almost naively, you know, doing like, okay, you want me to help you out? I'll help you out. And, and then they, they let him twist in the wind. Why do you think it is that that happened? Because we've seen FBI agents since then come out and say, you got to let him out. They had, you know, it was a state case. The FBI, they had two agents, Herman Groman and Greg Schwartz, who had been for years and years. They had somebody from the U.S. Attorney's Office who was pushing for it. And it's really, I mean, all you have to do is look at some of the people like Nathaniel Kraft, who was linked to possibly 20 murders in in Detroit. And he testified against some of the drug dealers and he served a fraction of the time. You have to look at when for a while Rick was in a witness protection program under, with the feds because of his cooperation on, and that sting, he was in Arizona. He was with Sammy the Bull, wow. John Gotti's you know, underboss. Sammy the Bull was responsible, tied to 19 murders, served five years for cooperating. I mean, granted, he, he turned against his boss there, but I, I've never ever seen that and it's only I, I have to blame people like Kim Worthy and other people in the system who co- really collaborated in, in, the, in their effort to try to keep him behind bars and, and paint him as as a danger to society which he he was a teenager he paid his dues nobody should be I mean I you know we can go on and you and I have, have talked about this before I, I feel like Kwame Kilpatrick oh yeah you know 20 28 years was too much but I know people who say well Whatever he gets, he deserved. You mentioned White Boy Rick's fame. Have you seen the, or celebrity and the struggle, or the issues with that? Have you seen the movie with Matthew McConaughey? And, uh, and how does that portray I, him? I have. You know what? 
I mean, he's he's portrayed as a guy who got sucked into stuff. I sat in the theater. I, I believe it was out in Novi. I sat next to Rick's son, oh, wow. who is uh, who at the time was dirty, and, and and Mike was there. I sat with Mike as well, and uh, uh, you know, it it was the the movie was disjointed. I mean, it didn't it skipped around, and and it wasn't a true chronological thing but i, I think the terrible. essence of it was that he got sucked into it i mean it was interesting also you know i i think rick loved his father but i think his father was not always the nicest guy and but i i had heard that matthew mcconaughey wanted to portray be portrayed as a nice guy in this film so they uh Nice it up, but I, you know, I think Rick still loved his, his dad. His dad was a very entrepreneurial guy, as was as was Rick. Rick, Rick was a very bright, bright guy. I mean, all the conversations I had with him, he he's a very smart guy, and I really, I, I, I pray that he, you know, does well when, on, on the outside. Are you surprised that we haven't heard or seen him since he's been out? I mean, there was one video of him leaving in an SUV, and poof has just disappeared and when was the last time you uh talked to him alan you know last time i talked to him was in i believe may uh i talked to him very briefly uh but that that was the last time and i hadn't talked to him for a while i mean he started getting it all these movies and documentaries were Uh-oh. happening Hollywood. and i think he had, he had to limit his the list of uh, people on, on phone calls. So I think I, I got kind of bumped off at some point after 20 years of, of talking to him, but I did talk to him in, in sometime in May. And uh, I mean, my understanding is that he's basically, uh, you know, he's, you know, he's in Metro Detroit area. He's got a, he's got a fiance, some, a woman that he reconnected with, who he'd grown up with, who's a very, very smart woman, a very good woman. And I hope she uh, helps, you know, helps him along in his re-entry. Uh, I think there's been a party, a welcome back, you know, welcome home party and his family. It's been their family and friends. And uh, I mean, so far, so good. But media, si- yeah. media silent. He hasn't talked to anyone in the media. He's not. You know what? I think part of the part of the issue is that he's still on parole. And I think he's been sort of uh, been instructed to uh-huh. really lay low and not, you know, not get out there and talk. I mean, look, he's, you know, over the years that I've talked to him, he was angry about the system and he, he got screwed. I, like I said, I've never, ever seen anyone offer, you know, cooperate with, with authorities the way he has and, and literally not get one day off his set, not one break. And it's really, and there, there's, it, it's it can only be there's only one explanation for this it's, it's something of a corrupt system there where people were really trying their best to undercut a teenager i mean a teenager at the time he's 51 years old now he's had a big chunk of his his life taken and it's he he he's he's not saying he didn't do anything wrong uh but you know some of the really guys who would be considered kingpins served half the time that he that he served one thing i think that 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 is worth putting in here and i'm wondering how big a factor you think this is is initially i think in the parole procedure he wasn't uh, as forthcoming as maybe you have to be to show people that you own all your crimes but he also committed a crime or at least admitted guilt to a crime it's not clear who all the participants were while he was in prison i mean that that may be another reason why he he got hung up so long. But no, no, he well, you know what? By, there was a I car. Th- that was in two thousand five. He had already been screwed on the pro in okay. two thousand three before okay. any, any of that happened. So, so you don't see there, that as fix, being the fix was in legit. I mean, okay. it, it didn't help. I mean, went down to Florida. The the Florida governor Ron DeSantis uh, was on, it was on, serves on the uh, parole board, and he. He was like, no, you're telling me, you know, they had the FBI guys that uh, I, I think it was Herman Groman saying, you know, he's an, been an ideal prisoner and, and he's saying ideal prisoner. Well, ideal prisoner doesn't commit crimes while he's behind bars. But for the most part, Rick was an ideal prisoner. He was really, you know, seldom got, but he did get in trouble. He was a, he was in the witness protection program when he was down in Florida, when he got in trouble down there. And, you know, they they kicked him out of that they brought him back to michigan but he's uh, it's just it's just too long i mean our, our system has to you know 
we don't have to be light on crime, but we don't have to be like way overboard on it either. People do get the system is set up for second chances. I have a question here from a actually from a special listener in Pittsburgh, a, a former uh, Detroit Free Press uh, uh, cop writer Ben Schmidt, who who wants to know um, how do you kind of restart your life after being put away for so long, and he also wants to know if you can get. Uh, Get white boy Rick on the podcast for us. <laughs> Are you <laughs> suggesting that Alan's just gotten out of prison? <laughs> yeah. yeah. yeah no, in. but uh, no. That's seriously, uh, I think it's a, I think it's a good question Ben posits, and um, yeah. I'll, I'll say, Does he have to be what? worried? I mean, he informed on a lot of people. Is there somebody waiting to to cancel his account? That's a good question too, Bigfoot. But uh, if you'll answer oh, mine first, that's fine, Alan. Thanks. You know I, what they say about know, big I, feet, Sean? Yeah. yeah okay. Right. I, big head. I, 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 I think part of it is, you know, he was in, he was in the halfway house down in Florida. He had a job, which is, yeah, asked me not to say what kind of job it was, but it was a, you know, a, a white collar type type thing. And uh, he, he's, you know, he got a cell phone. I mean, all that stuff to give him some transition in. He's got a, he's got a very supporting uh, fiance. And I, I've talked to her and she's really a good person and she's got it together and so i think he's you know but it's got to be hard you know it's got to be hard i mean you're i mean your whole life you've been really your you know very formative years you have been with criminals when you think about all the bad the worst behaved guys in junior high that you went with the guys who you know are all suddenly you're 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 your bunkie, you know, your, your roommates, your whatever, and you're, and you're dealing with a lot of distrust. So he's had a lifetime of dealing with a lot of guys who are criminals who at, where he's had a lot of distrust. So, I mean, I think that's part of reentry is trying to have some trust with people. And I mean, look, we've all been disappointed in our lives. We've all met people who have screwed us or, you know, we, we, we have some distrust of or whatever, but we've also been fortunate to have a lot of good people in our lives who we do trust, who we do care. Of. And, and Rick has had, you know, that's, that's an adjustment I think that hopefully you make, and I don't know how long that takes or, you know, if it takes some therapy or whatever, but it's not an easy transition back to suddenly trusting people for me that person is elric you know who's <laughs> kind of guided me and helped me along and uh, showed right, me the way sure, sure. that's right when but you i think he had a kilpatrick question so i'm gonna i'm gonna step <laughs> off to the side here yeah so so um so alan are, are you writing uh is your work on on uh richard worshi available because i gotta be careful now he's now he's white collar rick after what? that yeah, halfway well, house stop. So yeah. can, can people catch up with some of your work on, on uh, where she uh, at deadline, uh, deadline Detroit. Detroit. I, I wrote a piece on the day that he was released and I wrote one a couple months before when they set a parole date for him uh, okay. of July 20th. But uh, I really, you know, it's, it's really to me is amazing during the COVID. I mean, every prison system or at least tried to cut loose anybody who they saw as they could cut loose that it wouldn't be a big deal. I mean, you see, you know, co Michael Cohn mm. got, you know, cut yeah. loose and, 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 all and Roger other. Stone, maybe his name needs to rhyme. You got Cone yeah. and Stone and then right, right. Uh, You're right. Flynn so is it, in, it, but, but then but he's I not. really, you know, it, it, I'm sure it's a transition going back to society, you know, where it's like, you know, look in prison, you have to have a certain persona, so, you know, don't mess with me, don't, you know, you know, respect and to go into society, you know, where, you know, you got to adjust your ways a little bit. And I'm, I'm sure that's going to take a while to really get there where, where you're, you know, good with that. And that okay. I don't know what his celebrity status is going to be, where if he shows up at a CBS, if people <laughs> are going to come up to him or, you know, what's what's going to happen. If he's working in the pharmacy, I think that's going to be a problem. Yeah, yeah, he's not. He's not. <laughs> okay, good, good, and uh, and just uh, in a self fulfilling prophecy category, 
there was a passage in Kwame Kilpatrick's memoir about <laughs> encountering uh, Richard Wershey when they were in prison together. In oh, Michigan. right, right. Sure. So we we gotta we gotta we gotta put that on the record as well. Alan, uh, thanks so much for joining us. Please thanks. check out uh, Alan's work at DeadlineDetroit.com. Consider being a member. I'm a member. It's a monthly, easy donation to support some great independent journalism. And uh, we look forward to. Well, I don't look forward to your next scoop because it may come at my expense. But yeah. so <laughs> can, I, can I put a, uh, a little? It's to join. The membership oh, sure. is deadlinedetroit.com slash membership. And again, I want to thank Mike. Mike has been, you know, ML has been incredibly supportive and is, uh, is not only a great friend, but also incredibly supportive for Deadline Detroit. I mean, really. One, yeah. one last quick thing, Alan, maybe you can help sure. us, uh, Mark and us, Mark and I settle this. Is it ML? <laughs> is it Mike? Is it Michael? Uh, I usually call him Mike, but I know, okay. uh, yeah. Okay. That's that's my it's it's like my name Al Allen <laughs> whatever you know yeah, Rose, by any other name, I, I think if we could Hardly. just keep it to your excellency, that would be simpler, but uh, <laughs> that just hasn't really caught on. But, and also, if you go to DeadlineDetroit.com, you can sign the free Kilpatrick petition that's up there. Um, <laughs> you're going to want to you know, take advantage of that opportunity and uh, and see what else Alan's got cooking. There's good video, and they also have a very good podcast. You may want to make it your second choice for podcast viewing, but it's it's a, it's a close second. So, so Alan, thanks very much. Okay, we look thanks a lot. To thanks everybody. Good to see you. you, guys you Alan. To. Thanks, Alan. Alan Langle's appearance is brought to you by the Butchery, which is the place to go for prime meats. Alan himself is grade A journalist, so the Butchery. <laughs> if he was meat, they'd grind his ass up and put it behind the counter, and you would say, as single women across the metro area have said, delicious. Thank you, Alan. <laughs> I go there because they have the best quality USDA prime and all grass-fed beef, and their pork is 100% Michigan-raised. Plus, it's convenient. You can get your meat in any portions you want, everything from a single steak to half a cow. Uh, Chef Dave's wife makes some amazing desserts, and they have all kinds of other sundries there that you're going to want to pick up while you're there. All this month, if you listen and you go and tell Chef Dave that you heard about him on the Soul of Detroit and spend at least 50 bucks, you'll get a free pound of bacon. The butchery's on Orchard Lake Road. It's easy to find. Just take Telegraph to Orchard Lake Road and head west. I came all the way from the east side, but it was well worth the trip. I promise you it's worth the drive. 248-682-COWS. Give them a call at 248-682-COWS or visit their website, thebutcherysl.com, the best place for prime meats, eats, and treats. I won't change my mind on anything, regardless of the facts that are set out before me. I'm dug in. And I'll never change. Very nerd. Very so. Very nerd. Very so. Very nerd infinity. Very so infinity plus one. No. This week's great debate is brought to you by Luke Nowacki. Some people like to save up for something really nice, like a new earring that looks super cool. Or maybe even a time machine that could take you back to the 90s when dudes with earrings that weren't <laughs> pro athletes were a thing. If you're wondering how you can budget for a major purchase, call Luke Nowacki at 248-663-4748 or email him at L Nowacki, that's L N O W A C K I, at pinnaclewealthstrategies.com. He can assist you to devise a plan targeted to help you reach your financial goals. And with Luke Nowacki, he'll make it all about you, sweetheart. Securities and investment advisory services offered through Royal Alliance Associates Inc. Member FINRASIPC. Royal Alliance Associates Inc. is separately owned and other entities and or marketing names, products, or services referenced here are independent of Royal Alliance Associates Inc. So before we get to our great debate, I want to share a little social media experiment that I embarked on last week. President Trump finally put his uh, his imprimatur on mandatory, I don't want to say mandatory, but he says you should wear a mask. Mm -hmm. And so I put something on my Facebook and Twitter page that said, thank you, President Trump, for a little late telling people they should wear a mask. And the response was amazing. First of all, I heard from everybody <laughs> on Trump, because when you put Trump on social media, it just sends the needle flying. Yeah, everyone but has from to the say people, something, right? Yeah. And, and from the people who hated Trump, uh, I was immediately attacked because I said something nice about Trump. And from the people who love Trump, I was attacked because they said, oh, but you had to say something snotty, like it's about time or something like that. Ugh. And it just, it, it seems to me we're at a point again where no matter what you say about somebody, even if you try and pay them a compliment, it doesn't, doesn't get you anywhere because everybody's so set in their ways that we can't acknowledge on the one side, on the left, 
that someone's done something that's worthy of yep. praise. And on the right side, you can't acknowledge that there was any error ever yep. before. It's and an it's, all, just, it's an all or nothing proposition for some reason. I don't get it. I don't yeah, understand that. It, it, was, it was very disappointing to me because, uh, look, let's face it. Trump should have been on this mass thing a long time ago. And now he's trying to claim that he was. The facts just don't line up that way. But, you know, there's an old saying about coming to Jesus. It doesn't really matter when you come, just so long as you get there. But I guess Gross. when it comes to politics, it doesn't apply. And, and Sean, you were talking a little bit in the free press about masks. What, what did you hear back from people? <laughs> well, again, it just it depends on your, um, your view, your worldview, your politics. I think it, it lines up pretty I don't want to say completely, uh, it doesn't completely align party, one party to the other or one view to the other. I mean, they're outliers, but um, it, it also really depends. And Mark, you know, I've talked about this. It depends on where you get your information from and, and who you trust. Yeah. I mean, we had a, let's think about it this way. We, for a short, brief time with uh, Dr. Anthony Fauci, right? The top infectious disease specialist in the country, at least, you know, works with the NIH. <laughs> we all agreed with him or all looked to him and he had an approval rating what, up near 90%. How long did that window last? It, <laughs> not long. Not long, but, but at least, at least it shows you that for, you know, even for a couple of weeks, yeah. we can kind of agree on, on something. So, you know, that, that well, even though that change, it leaves me hopeful that we can maybe get back there again. And I, I've heard a lot of people try and discredit everything Fauci has said because initially he said, you know, eh, we don't need masks. And uh, and he was attacked. And, and I, I read a quote the other day from John Maynard Keynes, the great uh, economist, economist that I think kind of captures the way I feel about Fauci's um, evolution on this issue. And, and Keynes said, when the facts change, I change my mind. What do you do, sir? Yeah, It's not flip-flopping. This thing is developing. We're all learning and growing and getting more information every day. Well, so I, I don't I, think, I, I think I'd be more critical of someone who had new facts and just said, well, I said this a while ago. I guess I better stick to it. That's what the captain of the Titanic said. And where is he now? I understand why people would be mad because we were lied to. You know, we were told we don't need a mask. We don't need a mask when the real reason was. Please don't buy up all the masks, masks because first right. responders need. I understand why people would. But were, but were we lied to? I mean, that was. Yes, that we was, were. We were lied to. I I, I don't know, man. I, that information was out there almost immediately. Why Why we don't want masks? I mean, I remember uh, from the time they were saying we don't need them. And by the way, Fauci said we didn't need them before the pan. I mean, when it was still overseas, before it really hit here. Don't you remember him saying something like, we're not going to be needing to walk around in masks here. That was before the pandemic even really hit in this country. And then he said he didn't. But at that point, the, the WHO was already sort of saying out of the side of its mouth, here's why we don't want people to wear masks. I mean, that was pretty clear almost immediately. So is that really a lie? I, I, I feel like it was a lie. I, I And, you know, people are going to take that how they want to take it. But the beautiful thing about science is that it, it can change. You keep studying things because you learn more about them. And that's what... That's what really that my if I have one fear about the virus is that we don't know and sorry about sorry ML as a COVID nineteen survivor we don't know what the long lasting effects are and that it makes you a better lover that's what I've been uh, no, told no no well you were already you, a great you, were, lover. you, you weren't you were satisfied lover. I was not satisfied I, I, you were I was. it was way too I quick was. you've always been a great lover and that's fine it, but. it was it was the worst hour of your life <laughs> hour right. <laughs> Well, 30 seconds and then sitting there talking to you for the next 59 minutes. You mean, you mean listening? So was, you mean listening to him talk? Mike, ML, sorry, Mikey, Michael, uh, whatever. Let's um, get back to your highness. Okay, fine. Your excellency. Speaking of the column I wrote a couple of weeks ago about the mass. Yes, we were the, wondering when you are going to speak about that. We kind of teed it up about five minutes ago. I know. I'm trying to do the And you started talking though. about Kilpatrick. I don't want to just do, be El Ricky in the whole time and talk about myself. But, but um Real quickly, Mark, and this okay, is one, next. Thing that, one thing that I wanted to, to explore in that column was why this, uh, why so many people don't want to wear masks. It's not just the, the part of it's a conspiracy theory. Part of it's the confusing science, as you mentioned, the evolving science, the, the contradictory science back a, a few months ago. But also, too, there's this idea of what, what the mask represents. And I, and I wrote about this. Part of it's tied up in a, uh, with the Christian church 
and that part of some folks think it, it's uh, have likened it to slavery. You can see this on social media, like the masks that some the iron masks some slaves were forced to wear. I mean, it's really sort of interesting the lengths people go to to uh, to imbue that 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 symbol with something that's really dark and and dangerous and maybe speaks to the fall of society. It, there's there's a lot more of that out there than you think. I will say this though. I feel like the people that are very anti-mask, it makes a lot of noise and the media loves portraying, you know, the two sides of it, but I, it is still a very small, small percentage of people that don't wear them, especially in this day. We've done a pretty good job of, I mean, it's polls show we've done a good job wearing masks and sheltering in place for a while. Um, but as far compared to other states, we've done a pretty good job here. So I think there's just a lot of noise from the people that are just adamant. You don't need to wear them. But again, what you just said, it's about we do it well in Michigan, but not in every place, right? Uh, I think, but I think, don't you think on the whole that we've done, we haven't done as good of a job as, say, other countries, but on a whole, I think most people wear masks if they yeah, can't but, socially uh, distance. I agree, but if, if you go to some states and it's still, and it's 80%, you're like, oh, that's a great percentage, but that means, you know, in Texas... How many people are there? 30, 40, 40 million, whatever. But, but I feel and like it's 80%. If, how many people aren't? I mean, right? It's millions of people. So. I think, though, if you watch all these videos that pop up or if you watch, um, you know, certain news channels, you know, CNN will play tons of mask, um, you know, mask battles. And I just, I think it's a little skewed to make it look like, hey, it's it's 50-50. People don't, no, don't want to wear And it's not even right. close to that. Most people no, it's not. will wear them. Uh, some people begrudgingly wear them but I, I just think we do a better job on that and it's just a little misleading narrative it, uh, again i just think it depends on my high school in texas if you go on facebook and uh, the, the folks uh, that i graduated with i'm not gonna say what year okay 1984 in any case uh at least 50 percent of those people don't want to wear masks and they post about it all the time it's probably higher but do they so you said they don't want to i mean i don't want no to. they don't wear them and they say we're not going to wear them and, and the, when the, the governor of that state what's his name abbott governor abbott finally came down with a mandate what a couple of weeks ago uh, the, 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 a lot of people just went crazy well i i went to a graduation party the other day that was all pro mask people and nobody was wearing them so i think it's were not just people who are outspoken there are people who think I agree. That they're safe or they don't have to do it. And uh, between graduation season and Harper's and people being outside, uh, I think we're going to be in this kettle of fish for a while. And we certainly are going to need to wear masks when election day, the primary election, which is August 4th, comes along. And, and so we're kind of turning the ship to our great debate. Governor Whitmer perhaps, uh, well, I'm, I'm going to go out, I'm going to say appropriately said, we got to have mandatory masks. When you go into a store, you got to have a mask. When you're in public around other people, you got to have a mask. Um, but she says, when you go to vote, because Democrats are certainly hoping for a large turnout in Detroit and Michigan, mask wearing is encouraged, but not mandatory. Which is ridiculous. That's ridiculous. It, it, it is ridiculous. Can I make one last quick point? We talked about this earlier. Yeah. The, the Breitbart, the, the right wing news oh, site, God. Yeah. Facebook. They made it. They put a post yesterday on Facebook. It was a, it was a video that went viral. It was looked at fourteen million times, I think, before it was taken down. It shared six hundred thousand times. Similar, not quite the same on Twitter, YouTube. It was hundreds and hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of views. They all ended up taken down. But it was a group of doctors called Frontline Doctors. I don't know if they're real doctors or not. They were in white lab coats they in are. front of the U.S. Supreme Court they are saying we don't need masks and, then, and we don't need to get into hydrochloroquine but for now. But uh, they say we don't need masks, right? Mm -hmm. So that's 14 million people, Mark and Mike, that saw that argument for what looks like a real, real video with real science. Oh, I know. And all 14 million of them are going to send me an email after this show saying, didn't you see the video? That's you know whatever. What, and I'm like, I pull yeah, I also had 14 million people tell me the Mugen Mansion party happened and it didn't. Here's the problem with pulling it down. And first off, it's, it's going to drive me nuts because people are going to go for freedom of speech, which it's not freedom of speech. It's totally up to these publicly traded companies if they want that video up or if they don't want that video up. The problem with pulling it now is you're just feeding into the conspiracy theory. That you this are. is a government controlled thing. I would rather leave it up and maybe put a disclaimer on it that, uh, you know. Which this, they've done before, right? This doesn't meet the standard. You see yeah. It. Yeah. That's okay. That just means the deep state got to Facebook. Now, the funny thing is, Facebook's <laughs> own internal auditors have been saying the way we run this business is, is antithetical to democracy and that we're actually 
more free hate speech than free speech. And Zuckerberg is just like, yeah, whatever. I I can't, I can't hear you over the cash register. Say it again. But, uh, but, okay, but that's so a topic what, for another day. What, so, is, so, what is the argument, though, of saying, well, we can't mandate it at the polling at uh, polling places? I don't understand that. It's clearly political because she doesn't want to look like it is suppressing even one vote because someone couldn't find a mask or a piece of cloth to wear on their face. I agree with you 100%, Mark. So now I'm in the I'm uncomfortable at- position of suggesting something that a politician, if it's how they felt, should have said themselves, which is... If you put a restriction on a voter's right, like if you don't have a mask, you can't vote, that that may be unconstitutional. But if that's really what's motivating this, they should have said that. And certainly you can get these masks and hand them out to people as they come into the polling place. I mean, well, it's the same reason, too. She doesn't want to say, hey, protesters, those masks, you've got to wear those at protests. She hasn't done that. No, but that, but but there are plenty of places where there are exceptions to wearing the mask outside. So I don't think that's inconsistent at all. The protest part of it shouldn't they? Okay, let me ask you this. Let me ask you this though, Sean. Shouldn't the protesters wear masks? Absolutely. So why wouldn't the people that walk downtown Ann Arbor on Friday and Saturday night that don't wear masks? And yeah, but she's telling. She's telling the people in Ann Arbor that you have to wear a mask, but she's not saying it. No, she's not. Not unless you go inside. No, no. If you're in a public place around other people, you have to wear a mask now. If you're uh, six feet apart, right? But if you're on the sidewalk downtown, you do not have to wear a mask, right? But right. No, no. But if, if you're That's in a cluster of people, yeah. But you, well, can take- be in a, you can be in a relative cluster on a sidewalk and you still, it's not mandated to wear a mask if you're walking, right? You're not, I mean, that's not a violation as far as I understand. So it's kind of tricky. So for the voting, did you know, she, maybe the did, outside part of it, they don't need masks. But if you get in, they should wear them. Absolutely. Did she implore um, the uh, Operation Gridlock or the protest at the Capitol? Did she implore those, ask those people to wear masks? Well, she, she said they were going to cause uh, an but outbreak. She didn't mandate it, right? She just asked them to, just like she's asking the voters. My problem is, those well, she came system. pretty hard on them. That's the, the problem. Well, of course. And she's saying she wants people to watch uh, or to, to wear them now to go if they vote. My issue with it is very similar to pulling the videos down because now, it, to me, it seems very transparent. I, I generally like what she's done. That she's made some big mistakes, which we could really get into. But for the most part, I did. But it's it's very transparent. She won't tell protesters to wear masks, and she won't make it mandatory in voting because it's it's a political decision, and you're just feeding the flames of your opponents when you do that. Well, it's it's entirely possible that there's a constitutional element to this that you can't restrict somebody's voting rights. But if that's really what's going on, she should have said it. So in the meantime, Governor, if you want to be taken credibly, if you do not want to get pulled into political debates over public policy that makes perfect sense to people who are perfectly rational, you got to be consistent. And I would encourage you, if you can, to say, put on your damn mask everywhere. Oh man, the geeks have inherited the earth. Did I do that? What a dork. Does him wanting to play with us again mean that he's turning into a geek? Or we're turning into cool guys? If you realize being locked inside your home uh, is making those walls close, and they're they're getting way too small, then it's time to call our realty sponsor, Lindsay Broadwell. When it's time to move into a new home, whether you're buying, selling, or both, you need to contact Lindsay Broadwell. Your house is one of your most valuable investments, and that's why you need an agent you can trust and that knows the business inside and out. For us, that's Lindsay Broadwell, who started her career at Hall Financial and is an expert in real estate. She'll make sure you get the most out of your house and that everything goes smoothly by finding you a home that fits your lifestyle. Buyers, sellers, especially first-time buyers, make sure you contact Lindsay at broadwellhomes.com or 248-767-7767. She's a licensed realtor at REMAX Nexus. That's broadwellhomes.com. And with all our sponsors, please be sure to tell them ML sent you. And if you're using a promo code, it's real simple. It's ML. (laughs) So we go from the beauty to the beasts. And our Geek of the Week, once again, the competition is fierce. Our bronze medal finalist, like me, is a dog lover. Unlike me, there are no limits for this gentleman. The Free Press and WDIV revealed that a man from Garden City was charged with using a computer to commit a crime by posting a Craigslist ad seeking sex with dogs. Yeah. Now The, the problem with that is everybody knows dogs like Backpage.com. 
Yeah, exactly. And, you know, I mean... I'm very mad. I thought, I thought Sean would have laughed at that joke. Yeah. He's, uh, <laughs> just Sean laughs at nothing. Just a story. No, he laughs. Fine. He's furiously, oh, he's furiously delete, deleting his Tinder as we speak. That's even yeah. worse saying, oh, yeah, that's funny. <laughs> you're you're silver, <laughs> silver medalists. We're up to yeah. silver now, folks. Is the Minnesota it. couple thrown out of a Walmart oh, God. wearing face masks with swastikas on the front? Yeah. They said they're making a statement about how we're headed towards a socialist state, and this is really what we have to watch out for. Again, <laughs> You can't use the Nazis to make your point unless your point is the Nazis suck. What? Argument lost before it even begins. Why so you that, are a silver medalist. Why is that discussion happening at a Walmart in Minneapolis or, or somewhere in Minnesota? That's where they're making but, their big political. I mean, it's just silly. They just, no, but they shouldn't be kicked out for that if they're wearing a mask. I know it's offensive. As, why should they? I'm with the ACLU on this. Remember when they defended the right for the neo-Nazis to march in Skokie, Illinois? That's a, it's a landmark kind of yeah. case. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's the same here, but it's up to Walmart and Walmart. No, it is up to Walmart, but if they have a mask on and I know, you know, they can wear that's offensive. They can wear it in a public place walking down the street as far as absolutely. I mean, I I don't care anyway, but I understand why Walmart would be like, yeah, God, we don't want that here. So our our breaking news is our winner of geek of the week is Sean Windsor for being pro swastika face mask. (laughs) That's not how this was supposed (laughs) to play out. Be consistent with the first. uh, I hear you. I think that's a good point. I get you. Freedom of expression. Okay, no, I'm with you. I'm Beautiful. with you. But but our, our winner, uh, so we're going to stick with the script. The winner <laughs> is uh, is revealed by the Washington Post that reports that while ceremonies honoring the life of civil rights legend John Lewis kicked off over the weekend in Alabama, state rep Will Dismukas participated in a local celebration of another prominent figure in Southern history, Nathan Bedford Forrest. Now, Mark, you know Mr. Forrest for, for, sure. for a, another reason. Uh, Forrest Gump was named after him, right? Isn't that in the, in the movie, Forrest Gump? Oh, I don't know. Uh, but don't no, know. he was the founder of, of the KKK. He was a uh, Confederate uh, general, a pretty, pretty vicious yet successful one, even though they lost. But um, a fun fact came out about him last week for the fact that he died partially from having chronic diarrhea. Of which he <laughs> suffered from his whole life, which seems like, uh, I don't know, apropos. Yeah. But it's just Not nice guy, to know that a bad person suffered from chronic diarrhea their whole life. Sure. Well, it's, it just may be more proof he was full of shit, but not a guy you'd want to share a tent with, that's for sure. And one of the other reasons he's infamous is because he led the massacre of hundreds of black Union soldiers during the Battle of Fort Pillow yeah. in Tennessee and later becoming the first Grand Wizard of the KKK. So uh, Dismukas explained, uh, you know, he posted on social media, had a great time at Fort Dixie speaking, giving the invocation for Nathan Bedford Forrest annual birthday celebration. And he shared a photo of himself standing behind a lectern surrounded by several flags of the Confederacy. Always a great time and some sure enough good eating. He later told the local media when this kind of came out, that I guess with the anti-Southern sentiment and all, all the things that we have going on in the world today, there's a lot of people that are seeming to be more and more offended. We live in a time where we literally are going through cancel culture from all different areas and people are even more sensitive on different issues and different subjects. This was just one of those times that didn't quite go the way I expected and I never intended to bring hurt to anyone, especially my own family and everything that's been said. Well, while we're no friends of cancel culture, this has nothing to do with anti-Southern sentiment. This has everything to do with anti-Klan sentiment. So, Dismukas, since you don't get that, you get this, our Geek of the Week Award. The kids are soft. I don't care for that guy. Me neither. Too soft. I'm going to pretend like you need this to make my dick go soft. Uh, before I invite Professor Jennings to the lectern, which is not in any way adorned with flags of the Confederacy or anywhere, he's wearing uh, he's wearing old glory there on his on his dome. Uh, soft history, you know, is hard, 
and Matt's <laughs> going to show us how. But what's not hard is saving money on a mortgage. And David Hall and Hall Financial are working around the clock to help save you money by refinancing. They're super busy because people are taking advantage of the historically low rates. If you haven't refinanced in the past year, Hall Financial is here to help. Now's the time to lower your monthly payments and keep some extra money in your pocket as we go through these very turbulent times. By refinancing, you can probably skip a couple payments right off the top. So why not see if they can save you some money and cut your term? Hall's financial service is the fastest in the business. That's why they have more than 1,500 five-star reviews, including one from me because of the great work they did on the rental homes I purchased in East Lansing. Mm -hmm. Go to our webpage and click on the logo to get started or call 248-308-5000. That's Hall Financial. Lower payments, better options, more personal attention. NMLS 1467435. Breaking news. How many five-star reviews in the copy? Uh, more than 1,500. It's up to 1,700 now. Wow. So spread Which out. Which is more than 1,500. And it's all us, right? It's all listeners of well, It's also more than 1,700, jerk. Oh, yes. Ooh. it's uh, <laughs> This just in, shitload of people are real happy with David Hall. <laughs> and if you give him a call, you tell them ML sent you. Ask for Dan Morrison or anybody else who's answering the phone there because they're busy. So give him, give him a shout. Now, Professor, what's going on in the world of soft history? Soft history is all about baseball because oh. it is the opening week of baseball. So we're going to talk. It's probably the uh, closing week of baseball, too. Maybe. There's you no might be way. right. Yeah. Maybe not. Melodramatic, Mark, but go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> So we've, so we've narrowed it down to it may or may not be. So we got that yeah. salted away. Well, it is, it is for now. Okay, let's get started. This week in 1967, Detroit Tiger Will Horton swung the winning home run to cap off a game between the Tigers and the New York Yankees. What some people might not know is that night, management told every teammate to go directly home because of the Detroit riots except for Willie Horton, mm -hmm. who kept his uniform on, got in his car and drove in the middle of the riots, stood on the roof of his car and tried to bring peace to the violence. Now, either Horton had a huge set of cojones or he was way out in left field. Yeah, oh. very, very famous uh, story there. I thought, he, I thought it worked for a while, him quelling the protest down by the bar. I can't remember the name of the bar, though. Uh, this week in 2001, the, the, the Tigers Stadium was closed. Oh, it was yeah. built in 1912 at the cost of $300,000. In 2020, it would wor it'd be worth about $8 million to build, or more specifically, the amount of money that Cabrera accidentally leaves in his jacket <laughs> pocket. <laughs> um, were you one of those people, ML, that wanted the stadium to stay? Because I, I would think you would want Tiger Stadium to still be Tiger Stadium. Oh, yeah. I, yeah. I think they I missed a, a huge opportunity to somehow um, repurpose the ballpark and make it uh, one of the three stadiums that you would go to no matter who was playing there just because you wanted to go there. And the same way that people go to Wrigley and the same way that people go to Fenway. And when you look at what they've done around Fenway Park, mm -hmm. they've left the interior of the ballpark pretty much untouched. But mm -hmm. that whole area around Fenway is just it's an amazing, festive, fun place. And when I moved back to Detroit in 1999 to become the obituary writer and the night cops reporter at the Detroit Free Press, I took a part-time job working as a, as a vendor at Tiger Stadium just because I wanted to spend more time at Tiger Stadium before it was closed and get behind the scenes. And it was, uh, it was one of the best jobs right up there at the paint store, one of the best jobs I've ever had. And to that point, you wrote a good article on, what was his name, the vendor? sixty. MZ Griffin. Yeah. He's been at every Tiger opening day for 60 years. He's a vendor. It's a good story. He's, we'll put a yeah, link. He's, he, we'll put a link to that up on our website, along with a link to Sean's uh, column about masks, yeah. ma mask wearing. Um, funny story, when I was a vendor, uh, I wrote about my experiences for the free press. I didn't take the job thinking I would do that, but I had such a good time, I decided to, to do that. And um, in the uh, in the vendors um, kind of clubhouse, for lack of a better term, locker room, there was an old mirror uh, that had been turned upside down because uh, it had been cracked so many different ways. And on the bottom, you could still read upside down, it said, are you presentable to serve the public? So your idea mm -hmm. was you get in your gear, you look at yourself, you look good, get out there and get to work. Guys would play a dice game against that mirror. 
And so I wrote about that as part of my behind the scenes story. Huh. Not, not thinking a lot of guys huh. working at the ballpark read the free press. Oh, boy. So I came in for the next game, and there's a very narrow passageway to get into that room. And as I walked through the passageway to get in there, there were a bunch of guys waiting for me. And, uh, and they said, hey, uh, did you write that story in the paper? And I said, um, uh, yeah, uh, what did you think? You know, oh, and they're no. like, um, like, well, you know, they broke up the dice game. It turns out the guy who ran that part of the operation, who knew about the dice game, came in, took all the money off the floor, said this game's over, pocketed what? it, and that was the end of the dice game. So these guys were starting to close in on me. Yeah. And I just was able to get my back to that narrow entrance and just sort of back out of it, get my assignment, ran out. And I was selling hot dogs all damn day and hoping I didn't run into anybody. But, oh, uh, some man. Of, good job, Nark. Yeah, some of the guys <laughs> thought it was a good story, and, and I got good feedback. But, um, but yeah. yeah that, I, was a, that was a good story, too. <laughs> By the way, the, uh, the Tiger Stadium. Was Not never good enough. Fen- it was never Fenway or Wrigley. Come on. Thank you. Real. Yeah, let's be real. It was a little too small, but it was historic, obviously. Yeah, and, and I loved going small. there, but it, and I loved going there, but it wasn't. It's not those either. Of those places. It's much more like what Cleveland had. Oh and, yeah, uh, you know, it's just and it needed to go. Municipal. And uh, what they've done with it is actually great, despite the argument over the fact that there's turf on the on the fields now instead of grass. But I would um, much rather go to a game at Comerica. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's a money grab, but <laughs> it's down. much nicer. Sorry, if you ever sat in those seats behind home plate, which I would do after my vending shift because nobody was going to the ball games, the only person who's closer to balls and strikes is the umpire. You're looking right over the umpire and the catcher's shoulders that ball crosses a plate. Those seats, that the bleacher seats were great in the outfield. You actually had shade. There's no shade whatsoever at Comerica Park. Now, I'm not putting down Comerica Park. That's if we can't have true. Tiger Stadium, Comerica Park is a fine replacement. But the overhang, the lower deck seats, I mean, there were so many. Now, there were some problems. The, you the can't obs- go all the, the way around v- it. The obstructed and, view uh, behind the no, You know what? We used to yeah, fly but, across the country in DC-3s. You know, but, you know what I mean? <laughs> and that's great. And, and there were 54,000 <laughs> seats in Tiger Stadium. You could X off all the obstructive view seats and still have a 40,000 seat stadium. It was all about parking, number one, suites, number two, and vending. Yeah. They wanted their own vending, which the Illiches did for a year. And then they went back and sold to Sports Service, which well, was you kind know what? Of it's their team. Uh, yeah. a, and it just a, didn't A have baseball the team is a public trust. Ooh. They have a monopoly, and with that comes yeah. some responsibilities that a normal business holder should not uh, be held to. It's like Ford Field is a little nicer than the Silver Dome, you know? Yeah. Ford Field is vastly nicer than the Silver Dome. If anybody's uh, sentimental about the Silver Dome. <laughs> uh, you know what? The, you know. the Silver Dome did have one huge advantage, and you just mentioned it with the old Tiger team, is parking. And right. more fistfights. I, yeah, well, God, yeah. It was, it was, <laughs> the advantage it was of the Silver Dome is it means the shitty lions were further from my home in Pontiac than they are now. That's the only advantage. Uh-huh. And it was uh-huh. kind of cool to go in and out with the, the breeze, <laughs> the suction that was created because of the... Ford Field uh, is better, but... Tiger, no, Tiger, Tiger Stadium was great, but yeah. Okay, sorry, Matt. Sorry, well, Matt. I hope you guys enjoyed ML Soul of Detroit. Uh, Cyrus, <laughs> just take us out. <laughs> okay, I got one more for you guys. It's kind of a bonus one. Uh, this week in 1995, Kurt Gibson hit a 5- .538, seven thirteenths with five RBIs and two extra base hits on his 38th season. Less than a month later, he would retire as a Detroit Tiger and go from cracking bats in half to bending golf clubs in half with his knee. Um. <laughs> I guess that's you true. guys are assholes. <laughs> Why? I, I was waiting for a punchline. I've got I've got the brand new voice meter, banana, and I'm going to put a audio drop every time <laughs> no, there's silence. I'll just start playing drops. Is well, okay, you, you, anyway, you had a little <laughs> flutter in there with the audio, so I think we missed uh, <laughs> a joke. I'm I'm hoping we missed the key don't, point there. Don't <laughs> just, li- don't lie to him. <laughs> there was a flutter. <laughs> <laughs> well, less than a month later, he would retire as a Detroit tri- Tiger and go back. God damn it. See, now I'm screwing myself up. <laughs> <laughs> Just power through it. Okay. Which reminds me, August 14th through the 17th is the virtual Kirk Gibson Golf Classic. I'll be joining along with many others to help Kirk fight 
Parkinson's disease. And if you're not a golfer, you can sponsor someone or just donate. For details or to sign up, go to KirkGibsonFoundation.org. All proceeds go to fight Parkinson's disease. Okay, second down and nine. Well done. Yeah. Did you mention the website? I don't know. I spaced out. Kirk yeah, Gibson Foundation. www.KirkGibsonFoundation.org. Click the link. It's the first link in the website to uh, to join the golf outing, and it's going to be a lot of fun wherever you're going, I'm sure. Beautiful. You know, I, I love Matt's heart and uh, kindness and generosity. You just soul. hate his Wasn't jokes. Wasn't supposed to be originally a, a few jokes? <laughs> Not well, deep history and charity and all that sort of thing. I'm, I'm trying to figure out what's going on. I'm confused, I guess is what I'm saying. And I'm often confused, but please well, my, help, help me out. The ED charity I'm sponsoring for you is next week, so don't <laughs> cut me off so <laughs> that early. That was your best joke, man. That yeah, was off there the you go. Now that's more like it. Well that's more done. Like it. <laughs> So we actually have some more sponsors, but uh, I've actually been getting offers over the last 20 minutes from people saying we'll give you more money not to associate you with our show. So we uh, we appreciate that. With everybody else, use the promo code ML. We're going to tell them Solar Detroit sent you, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, we... Um, we are pleased to be here in room 7609, the place where new wave music lives on and where bands that you kind of missed get a second chance or bands that you know and love have a hit that somehow missed. We're here to give that a second chance. And in keeping with our Manscaped theme, again, manscaped.com, where you can get personal grooming products for men and ladies and some other nice accessories. If you go there, you'll understand why we've chosen to play this band. Of course, it's the Buzzcocks. Well, you've tried it just for once, find it all right for kicks. But now you find out that it's a habit that sticks and you're an orgasm addict. You're an orgasm addict. Sneaking in the back door with Teddy might seem So your mother wants to know what all the stains on your jeans And you're an orgasm addict. You're an orgasm addict. But you still keep it beat and you meet to pulp And you're an orgasmatic You're an orgasmatic You're a kick a Sonova You're a nacho who's at pizza Live all the fucking yourself to death Orgasmatic You're an orgasmatic Uh-huh The Buzzcocks with Orgasm Addict. The uh, the Buzzcocks were one of the the early Manchester music scene. Um, uh, I guess I guess I would say progenitors of the way things would sort of play out with independent labels and uh, and sort of making your own mark, making your own way. They had cross paths after they got up and running with Malcolm McLaren, who was one of the people behind the Sex Pistols and actually played some shows with the Sex Pistols in Manchester. So sort of a post-punk, pre-new wave, but eventually 
they sort of refined their sound a little bit. And you probably know them from, if you know them at all, from their song, Have You Ever Fallen In Love, which is a little more tender and a little more, um, I guess I would say, subtle uh, tune than Orgasm Addict. But uh, people who started watching MTV, like me, will know their lead singer from his solo work. That's Pete Shelley, who had a minor... Um, minor hit and was early on in heavy rotation at MTV, which was Homo Sapiens. I don't know if anybody oh, else remembers that song. Yeah, there, I know that song. Uh, yeah, it was it was almost a, a robotic uh, sort of delivery. It yeah. was certainly um, not quite as as uh, energetic as as what you heard there. But uh, but that's the Buzzcocks. One more reason uh, to go bo- to Manscaped. Both Homo Sapien and Orgasm Attic uh, both were banned uh, by the BBC. So Pete Shelley's got a, a good track record in getting songs banned. Uh, from the yeah, you know. they they were pretty edgy. They were pretty out there, and uh, and Pete Shelley was uh, he just passed a couple of years ago, but he was gay, which again yep. he was kind of out front of that. He was someone who had the courage to not only uh, foray into a uh, a bold genre of music, but was also pretty open about his own personal lifestyle, which. No, wasn't that's easy that. to do even in the punk scene back then. Uh, Buzzcocks really surprised me, though. That's not really new wave. You don't think so? No, that's punk. It definitely is punk, but when you listen to things like Have You Ever Fallen In Love, you get mm. more of that sort of melodic, uh, you know, boy meets girl type of, of story that you hear in a lot of new wave new wave music. But again, with, with Room 7609, we're trying to introduce you to parts of uh, sure. a band's catalog that you may have missed the problem here may be that people didn't really know, have you ever fallen in love by the Buzzcocks? But they were a band that were very influential on a lot of groups to come later. So it's something that... Uh, is, that also, may... is that also because they're from Manchester? You seem to love bands from Manchester, England. Hey, it's the Detroit of England. How can you go wrong? Okay. But anyways, <laughs> that is Room 7609. Of course, we always Sean love to get it. your we nominations for bands. You can send us your nominations at ML Soul of Detroit at gmail.com. You can call us at 313-288-9070. I think you got it, it, yeah. It's, it's been a while since I called. That's Butterfield 8 yep. 9070. And we love to get your feedback, even when it's not always glowing, which brings us to this week's feedback. Oh, great. Mailbag was a little rough. Um, starting with uh, Michael4459. And Michael, we're going to find your ass. Anyways, (laughs) uh, he says, I am not really understanding Matt Jennings' role on the show. I feel like he just forced his way into the show because he could make corny soft magazine covers. Oh. Hmm. That's a three-star review. I don't know about that. I like what Matt brings to the show. And I uh, I think I feel like I know more about the world every time he joins us. Now, I'm not sure it's the world we live in, but it's a, it's a history lesson. Uh, Spurred 99 says, I enjoy the show and awful, often feel Mark and ML consider multiple points of views on topics. I appreciate their willingness to look at different sides and their ability to share different perspectives. Sean, however, comes off so arrogant and extremely what? opinionated and leans in, appears to lean in one political direction. After the conversation about school on July 15th, I was so bothered by Sean's opinion. I question if he understands what kids need to learn and if he even values children getting an education. <laughs> That's quite a leap. Well, he has two of them, so yeah. Yeah. I'll defend you. I'll defend you all day. No, I value life more, but go ahead. Yeah, it's like is this is this did Gordo does Gordo have a nom de plume here? <laughs> uh, uh, I, the, love, uh, I love your point of view, Sean. That's right. Hey, of course I lean in one direction. Even if I don't agree with That's it right. all the time. I like I like people. You know? uh, yeah. Sean Bravo. Sean yeah. bends to the left as Matt's ED fundraiser will uh, <laughs> will prove, um, and we'll have pictures nowhere on no, the internet. No. Yeah. Uh, Stud Muffin four seven four says ML love listening. The July eighth cast was great. I wonder why cases of COVID are reported breathlessly by the press, but no follow up on hospitalizations or deaths by the media. If these cases are reported, so what was the fallout? If you want to wear a mask, great. If you don't, fine. We are adults. You are or seem to be a libertarian. When did the governors get the right to determine what we have to wear? The Bill of Rights and the constitutional amendments are not confined to non-pandemic times. Our governor does not explain why she sees our rights in the lens of a hierarchy of which we are more import. They are rights as shown through history and the Constitution. I wish the press would push back on the statements with no retort by them as to why. 
would love for you to develop a TMZ like show for politicians show why the fly all over and why when we are told to stay home like good little boys and girls meet them at the airport or on the beach and ask how why etc love the podcast mm. a lot going on with the stub muffin but i like the way he ended right. on a positive note so Take we are always feedback. happy to have your feedback whether it's it's cruel to be kind we want to hear from you and if you have something to say you can participate in a program we call Cami Soul, where for a $20 donation to our website, you can give us a message that we will read during the show. Uh, we prefer it to be suitable for gentle ears, but we will try to read as much as we can. You can donate to our show. Mark, how, how do they do that? MLSolaDetroit.com, donate button. Uh, someday, someday it'll, there'll be a recurring donation choice on there. I don't know when that day is going to happen. So we're, just we're, to wrap up real quick, <laughs> we, the readers don't like, the listeners don't like Matt. They don't like me. They like Mark. We're not sure about Mike. Yeah, they, they, uh, they want me to ask more questions. But uh, everybody doesn't like everyone. It's, it's, they it's all like Mark. But, yeah. um, they all like believe Mark. Me. Know, he, believe me. They don't. Mark is kind, and he uses hair product. And uh, you know, <laughs> I need hair Actually, hair. Yeah, we just got some more uh, feedback that says Mark is a lousy kiss and kisser. It's from Father Feeling. Yeah, no, he knows. So that. there's depends there's what some, part uh, I'm kissing. So there we go. So that everybody took what? a shot this week. Anyways, we would love to hear from you from you at mlsoulofdetroit at gmail.com or leave us a voicemail. As far as recurring donations, those are great, but there are some people who are making it work on their own. I'm speaking, of course, of Frank and Kristen, who clocked in again last week. We really appreciate those donations. Keith, thank you, Captain, for the donation. Tim, thanks again for another very generous donation. And Dave. We're going to take your money, which you so kindly gave us, and use it to make the world a better place. Mm -hmm. And if you want something for your money, who doesn't want a return on their investment? Check out some of our great merchandise at the Drew and Mike store. That's drewandmikestore.com. We're having a sale on our hockey jerseys, 20% off, and we will throw in a free Kwame Sutra for you. If you want a Kwame Sutra or a hat or that Manscaped t-shirt, send us proof that you spent $75 at Manscaped. Dot com. Use promo code ML and you'll help us while helping yourself. Um, before we go, we want to say a quick word for a couple other long-term sponsors who could use your help. That Zot Ford and all the Zot dealerships go to dealsinthed.com. They are selling cars, they are fixing cars, and they are ready to take your call. And if you want to hit the streets of Detroit in a different way, maybe with something sudsy in hands, check out the Michigan Peddler. That's Michigan P-E-D-A-L-E-R. They are doing some uh, pedal pubs. I saw them out there last night, so check them out. And, of course, we want to support the other shows on the Red Shovel Network. That would be Charlie the Duff's No BS News Hour, No Filter Sports with Eli, Denny, and Bob, and the Drew and Mike podcast, which you can hear almost every day here on the Red Shovel Network. And at this point, I think it's time for us to ask our friend Cyrus to show us the door. <laughs> Can you dig that? Can you dig it? Can you dig it? When you're asked to try a podcast, you want to know and you ought to know what that podcast is meant to people who listen to it and listen to it every week. For almost a year now, a medical specialist has given a group of Soul of Detroit listeners thorough examinations every two months. He reports no adverse effects to their noses, their throats, or sinuses from listening to the Soul of Detroit. More and more men and women all over the country are finding out every day that Soul of Detroit is best for them. Enjoy your listening. Try Soul of Detroit today. You'll find Soul of Detroit much milder with an extraordinarily good taste.